I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Suzanne Moser, the lead researcher on this project, to share key findings and best practices for sea level rise communication and engagement in San Mateo County. But before we do that, uh, I am going to ask Hillary to jump back in and just provide a little bit of background on where San Mateo County's sea level rise planning efforts are at to date. Hillary? Yes, great. Thanks, Kara. Um, so I will just jump right in to first a brief update about our Sustainability Academy. This webinar today is a partnership between the Look Ahead Project and our Sustainability Academy at the Office of Sustainability. And I wanted to let you know that our Office of Sustainability's objective is to promote sustainability in the county through planning, development, and implementation of many different types of programs. We have programs in energy and environment, climate change, waste reduction, and livable communities. Through the Academy, we have no-cost no sustainability educational opportunities that we offer to members of San Mateo County. Our goal is to raise awareness around sustainability and empower our community members with the knowledge and skills to promote resource conservation in their communities. So here's an overview of some of our upcoming, we have two upcoming webinars on water and transportation and a number of workshops coming up. Here's a, our team. Unsu is the leader of our Sustainability Academy, and her contact information is on the last slide. So now I'll briefly go over where we are on our sea level rise preparedness efforts. Our, th this will be a brief update on our initiative and then some ways to get involved in our upcoming release of our vulnerability assessment and planning efforts. Our initiative is called Sea Change, SMC. This was started in 2015 thanks to the leadership of Supervisor Pine and also from, uh, thanks to funding from the California Coastal Conservancy. The goal of our initiative is to raise awareness and understanding of the issue of sea level rise and increase coordination on sea level rise planning across the county. The Sea Change SMC initiative has three main steps. We are currently in the assessment phase, which involves conducting um, a study to understand what is at risk today and in the future to sea level rise. Then we will move into resilience planning, which is about understanding the feasibility of different strategies, updating plans and policies to address risks. The final stage is implementation, which involves building projects on the ground and the implementation of policies. So I wanted to let you all know that we are getting very close to releasing our study, our vulnerability assessment, on what, what's at risk on both the bay and the coast side from sea level rise. And there will be some opportunities to share your thoughts on the assessment as, and on planning for sea level rise in the future. So some of these in the near term, when we release the document in the next couple of weeks, we encourage you to share the document, to review it, and we will be having a public meeting at the Board of Supervisors, at the County Board of Supervisors on April 11th. So that is an opportunity for you to come and share your perspective on the, the work we're doing in the county and how you, like, you see that going forward. And once we have the final document completed, which will be this summer, we will be having public workshops to share the results and then start to get input on next steps. We also, um, as cities, our 20 cities in the, the county are interested, we will be presenting to their councils. And that is an opportunity for those of you in different cities to share with your city council how, how um, you know, your perspective on this issue. Longer term efforts, um, and some of these actually will merge with near term different cities throughout the county are in different phases of updating their planning documents. And we really encourage those of you um, in different cities to be involved in these processes and share your thoughts um, on how to address sea level rise in these efforts. And in the future, when we're on our really start phase two planning efforts, we will have opportunities for public involvement as well. So that's all I have. I have my contact information here so that it's in the slide deck. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Suzanne Mosier. Thank you, Kara, and thank you, Hillary. Um, for what I wanted to do uh, in this presentation is to give you a little bit of context of why we uh, added the research component um, to uh, this, this project um, and what we found in that. Um, and anyway, we're, we're going to jump right in here with, um, you know, the overview that I'm going to present the findings and then 
offer some tips and tools um, for what it means for engagement. And as Kara was saying on Saturday, we're going to go into greater depth. And if you're interested in that workshop, then uh, uh, Hillary can uh, tell you later how to sign up for that. So um, just very briefly, um, where did San Mateo County start? Um, why did they engage in this project with us? Um, as you, you know, heard, um, Hillary and her office are very interested in actually having the public be actively involved in coastal adaptation planning. Um, but in order to do that, um, people really need to be equipped, if you will, with some knowledge about, well, how do people think about this issue? Um, what works um, in terms of communication and engagement? And so we wanted to do this project as a support to the county's efforts in uh, moving adaptation planning, resilience planning forward. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of background of you know, what we already know and what we don't know about how to engage people with, uh, on this very difficult topic, there is by now, after you know, 20 years or so of talking, quite a broad awareness of climate change, but there isn't an equally shared sense of urgency to do anything about it. Oh, sea level rise, isn't that in 100 years from now? Oh, we got time. There's more important things right now to do, right? So that's the, the a very uh, broad uh, situation that we're finding ourselves in. People get that it's increasingly humans who are causing this problems, um, although, you know, there are plenty of folks still who contest that. There is an awareness that there's a, a, a scientific consensus around it, but it's, you know, it's still there's still a lot of people who would argue with you, well, the scientists don't agree, so we have to wait until they, they do agree. Well, it's actually not true. That is a constructed sense um, in the media. We are actually at a point where the vast majority of scientists agree that it is human cause, it's underway, and it's very serious, and we need to do something about it. Um, we also know that the uh, awareness of climate change impacts are rising simply because they're showing up in communities. There are more extreme events, but there's also these sunny day impacts like tidal flooding that you have all experienced in your own county. Uh, if you go to the next uh, point here about the limited active public engagement, basically what we, what we see is that you know, this awareness that has grown has not necessarily led to political action. And, all of you will probably smile, not just about sort of, you know, what's happening locally, but of course uh, across the nation and, and how we have just lost leadership around this at the federal level. So there is very limited um, public engagement, um, and there are many reasons for that. Um, you know, whether or not people sense that urgency or whether they just don't know how, um, there are many reasons. The polarized debate is a turnoff for most people. Um, People don't necessarily know how to address these large global issues, and so when you're faced with an issue that's sort of beyond your personal uh, ability to, to solve, well, that's really too hard to bear. So people become numb, deny it, go into hiding, and just turn the channel to something more fun. Um, anyway, so as far as adaptation is concerned, most people still don't know what that means, what we need to do, and so again, it adds to the sense of not knowing how. So that's where we are. And what we're trying to figure out with this, if you go to the next slide here, is how could we use a visualization of the impacts that could happen um, to, in Mateo County, to, to different locations within the places where people live, how can we use that to essentially get people more motivated and, and get them mobilized to take actions. And think about this, the kinds of visuals we've used to date. You see here the first one is the typical climate change sea level rise curve that you've seen a thousand times. Oh well, you know, what? it doesn't mobilize you very much. If you move to the next one, well, you've seen that probably a bunch of times. BCDC, the Bay Conservation Development Commission, uh, has publicized, uh, you know, aerial photography with, with basically uh, using geographic information systems to show where the flooding would go, where the inundation would go from this bird's eye view if we didn't do anything about it. And if you go to the next one, um, you see that some people have turned this now using Google Earth into sort of a 3D thing. Well, that's still nice, but it's still far away. You can't see exactly where you live, right? And then there's some people who say, well, why don't we just go into the communities and draw a line and show them where it would be? 
Well, that's the next step, right? It becomes more personal with that. People have gotten quite rallied up about these kinds of effects. Of, I know they've been used in Santa Barbara and other places around the country, but it's still, the water isn't there. You can't see it, right? So what we wanted to do is to use the best possible visualizations to help people understand what it would mean right in their face. So if you go to the next one, um, what we know about visualization is that when the visuals are realistic, when they show it really immediately, like right in the places where you are, where, you know, it could happen right here. Um, when you feel like, whoa, this is personally relevant, I drive on this road, I walk on this path, I, I come here, then it becomes all of a sudden something very much relatable. When it is something that relates to everyday life, it isn't you know, some faraway extreme event or it isn't happening to the polar bear far away, but it happens to you right here. Um, and when you can see the difference between no action and action, in other words, when you can see the consequences of not doing anything, then the visuals become powerful means to engage people. So if you go to the next slide, what we then wanted to, you know, answer with this research is, are there particular benefits and maybe challenges associated with using the OWL technology, which I'll say more about in a moment, to help people engage with the topic of climate change? Um, what are the broader benefits of doing that? Can we change concern? Can we motivate people to action? And are there differences by age? Who knows, right? And then finally, um, depending on whatever the, the findings are to these questions, can we explain these visualizations and can we help people overcome those uh, engagement hurdles? If you go to the next slide, that's why we did what we did with the Look Ahead project. I call it the OWL experiment because the particular um, technology we use was developed by OWLIZE and it is one of those uh, viewfinders that you've seen probably many times in landscapes with beautiful vistas. You put in a quarter and then you have a greater um, view of it. Well, in this case, you don't need a quarter. You just basically look through it and what you see is the future. What you see is the current risk and then in the next uh, visualization after that, you will see what it would mean if you didn't take any action but sea level rise, rise was three feet higher. And beyond that, we use two potential adaptation options. One that is currently planned. We did this in Coyote Point Park. And so right there at this uh, location, there's already a plan for doing something for an eroding shoreline. Um, I'll show you the, the visual in a moment. And then um, beyond that, if sea level rise, uh, rises further, goes, uh, comes up higher, then what other options do we have? And we showed another option. We had the owls up actually from the beginning of August in 2016, um, but there were earlier challenges, so we only count the number of uh, participants in this project from September to January, so about 17 weeks. Um, it's in a, you know, right along the path here, you see the location that was a, a picture from the launch event. Um, and then we did repeated email outreach, hosted outreach events. Uh, we did the focus groups and actually we're doing interviews with some of the folks who have used the OWL to better understand their experience. And that's still ongoing. So here you just see a couple of the, and this, this next slide, you see a couple of the present, um, the visualizations. The first one is this present day flooding at King Tide. Not a big deal at this particular location. You can see it looks like somebody can just ride their bike through the puddle, right? It's not a big deal. Now, in other locations around the county, and you know this well, um, even king tide flooding can already be much more significant and disrupt traffic, disrupt um, access to certain uh, locations. Now, after that, the second uh, risk uh, visualization that we use is this future flooding. Same type of you know, event with a storm and three feet of sea level rise. This is the 360 view. You can actually turn the owls all the way around and see that. And in this particular instance, when you looked all the way around, you essentially found yourself standing in water. So this is how this becomes quite visceral. If you go to the next slide, you see um, the, the two adaptation options. One on the top here is this pocket beach with some setback off the parking lot further back than it is right now, which basically shows how, you know, the county is already planning to um, modify that particularly eroding shoreline, still keep it as a recreational opportunity, um, you know, not super different from what it is right now, uh, but essentially illustrating, um, you know, what could be done 
in the near term, and this is in fact already a planned option. Now, in the next slide, but in the next picture right there underneath, you see, you know, from this particular location that if sea level rises further, the county could choose to build out from that particular location and, and do an extensive wetland restoration type, a soft green uh, infrastructure kind of uh, uh, construction to protect that particular location. If you just click once, Meredith, uh, you should see a sort of almost a bird's eye view on what that would look like. If you could be a little bit higher, you could see the, the sort of going further out and, and what that might look like. Um, new uh, uh, recreational opportunities, birding opportunities, habitat, and still obviously very much used, but moving out into the bay to, to protect this particular location a little bit. So those are just possibilities. This is not set in stone at all. This is simply to you know, get, get people an idea of what one might do uh, in this particular location. If you go to the next one, so as you look through this in the OWL, these five options, we embedded in that viewer five simple survey questions. One asked them about concern of current flooding, one about future flooding with that higher sea level. The next one is about supporting currently planned adaptation options or getting underway right away with planning for adaptation. And then the fourth question is about how much would you want to get engaged in this in this type of activity. The fifth question was about the age group. There was an opportunity to leave audio recordings. Um, we're still analyzing those. Um, we did uh, observations to just see how people are using these uh, this viewer. Um, we had a project web page. Um, that's the lookahead-smc.org um, web, web page where you can see the same things from the comfort of your living room. So it's a different situation, but still you can get all the information. Then we had these hosted sessions. Five were planned. One didn't happen because of bad weather, uh, and one didn't get recorded. So um, unfortunately, the, the owl didn't work at that point. But basically, we have some information from specific groups that came. We did the focus groups, and we're doing interviews that are still going on right now. And that's what I want to um, give you a bit of a sense of what did we find so far from this. So this is going on. Let's go to the next slide. We're turning to the findings. What you see here is the number of people, the percentage of people that responded um, to the survey questions during this period from early September to early January. Now, Kara mentioned earlier there were about 4,000, and it's true that um, you know closer, if you took the time all the way from uh, August to uh, January, it would be closer to 4,000. But there were challenges, and, and so the data, the earlier data were not reliable, so we're just using it from when the thing actually worked. And so what you're seeing here is that about you know 3,000, more than 3,000 people clicked it on and um, found half of them found it interesting enough to actually go through the process of answering the questions. And there's a slight decline, once they got hooked, if you will, there's a slight decline. It's much less than in a previous experience, experiment where uh, we did this in Marin County. But this is an interesting finding that you know we had essentially more than 1,500 answers um, to, to, you know, to basically to all the rest of the questions. And the reason this is significant, I want to point it out, is that most national surveys that are viewed as representative of the whole nation involve about 1,000 people. So having you know, this many people that are participating in our study is actually giving us quite a bit of confidence that these data mean something. This, you, know, you, you should consider this reliable for San Mateo County, or at least for this location, for people who use that. So if you go to the next one, in terms of this level of concern about current flooding risk, really important. So we're looking now just at the people who actually answered that question. How concerned are you about the existing flooding risk that we showed in that one picture? Well, it's a really important finding that people come in to this experiment already feeling extremely concerned or very concerned. More than half feel extremely or very concerned about climate change and sea level rise impacts like flooding already. If you go to the next slide, when we shifted it to the higher level, there's a, you know, you would sort of intuitively expect that people actually would be more concerned um, because it's worse flooding, right? Well, it was a really interesting finding, surprising finding, 
um, that this is actually not the case. Um, we found that people who came in, you know, feeling uh, very concerned before now feel slightly less concerned, and the people who, you know, the proportion of people who said, oh, I'm not so very concerned, uh, I'm not, not at all concerned, that proportion went up. Whoa, how do you make sense of that? I'll come back to that, so hold that for a moment. Um, it's a very interesting finding. Um, the next question that we ask is, how much do you support, and you see the exact wording of the question here, but essentially how much support um, is there for immediate community action, whether it's for San Mateo County or for any city that people who came to this live in. And what, what we find is really important too, there is extreme and very strong support of getting started on doing something about adaptation, getting going in each of the cities. In other words, do not delay, time is now to work on this. If you go to the next one, when we ask people how much would you like to be involved in this, this is actually not surprising to me um, that you know, the majority of people are actually not interested in being involved or maybe only interested, but nah, they're not gonna come to any meeting, they're not wanting to do much more about it. Now, having said that, there is still 45% or so who want to be involved in one way or another. The, the biggest group within that 45% wants more information. Not super active, but still. 14% um, are willing to attend the meeting, and 10% want to take an active role in that. They want to be leaders in their community, and that is a, a you know, 10% out of whatever, 1,200 here, there's lots of people here who would show up at one of these possibilities that Hillary laid out earlier, responding to the plan, the assessment, getting engaged, um, you know, bringing more community members in. So basically the question for engagement is how can you get these people who are more information, want to attend a meeting or want to play an active role, how can you mobilize them to action? One more quick thing I want to say about this, there is a strong concern, a strong correlation between people who have a high level of concern about future flooding, they also want to, they, they are more strongly supportive of action now, and they are more strongly interested in, in having a greater level of in, engagement. Um, so there's clear relationship between concern and that. If you go to the next slide, you see the age distribution of owl users, and that's a really interesting finding. Now. This is in a park, a recreational area, not far from it is a, a playground, Curiosity is not far from it, lots of kids with their young parents. And so that's why you see most of the, the population that responded is very young, under 15 or in that early parental age, if you will, young adults, um, and a smaller number of, of you know, folks in the older age groups. And we looked into for detail in the next slide can we see any differences in the age and um, uh, across, in terms of concern and engagement? And what you see is that across all the age groups, about a third of them is already extremely concerned about current flood risk. So they're getting it, right? There, there's already a really high level of, of concern there. What's interesting is that the oldest age group has the greatest percentage of people who are not at all concerned about the current risk, and the greatest percentage that is either not at all concerned or extremely concerned about future flood risk. So it's a, sort of a bimodal you know, a distribution here in terms of um, where the oldest generation falls. So interesting distribution. The youngest age group has the smallest percentage of people who are extremely or very concerned about the current or future flood risk. And it's not super surprising, right, because you might say, well, some of them get it, right? That's the, the 15 year olds. The five year olds, not so much. <laughs> They're all in this potentially. Um, so this is just simply um, a, a finding that, that isn't super surprising, but it's an important one to keep in mind in terms of who you wanna reach out to and who you can get. In terms of adaptation interest, um, again, 50 to 78% across all the age groups strongly support immediate action with the strongest support among the young adults. Now that's important. Those are the parents of those small kids. They really wanna see that somebody take care of the future of their children. Um, in terms of engagement, again, the young adults are most interested in taking an active role in their community. That's really 
really interesting. And it's also really challenging because they hold jobs, they need to, you know, take care of their kids. How are you mobilizing those folks who basically are super busy um, to get them to come to the meetings that they want to take, uh, that, they, that, that you have the opportunities for them to come to? The oldest and the youngest have the largest proportion of individuals who wish for no further involvement. So much tougher to get them mobilized. You know, so I'm just saying this as, you know, what are the possibilities of who to mobilize? Just a few words about the focus groups and the hosted sessions. We are able to distinct, or, you know, pull out the responses from them uh, to the survey questions because each of them also went to uh, the OWL. Generally speaking, the pattern of response is very similar to the overall findings that I just gave you, except that the focus group participants are older on average, um, and I'll come back to who they were in a moment. Uh, no one in the focus group was not at all concerned, whereas there are some in the general population. Um, and the hosted session participants show overall a greater interest in the issue of sea level rise and adaptation, and they have a greater desire to be actively engaged. And again, that's not super surprising. They showed up for one of those hosted sessions. So <laughs> you would think they're already more interested. So not a big surprise there, but I just want to point out some of the, the differences. In terms of the um, focus groups, so we did six focus groups, two um, with elected officials, two with city and government, uh, county government staff, and two with what the county calls conversation starters. Those are individuals, and many of you who are on the, on the list here today actually are falling into that category. You have expressed already an interest in, yes, I want to have these conversations with my neighbors, with my colleagues, with my friends, um, so sign me up, help me do that well, and, and that's why you're here. So um, we wanted to understand from each of these groups what was their OWL experience like, what are their concerns, what are their, the, the barriers to adaptation, how do they think about that, and how can we overcome them together, what do they need to basically get over those hurdles. In terms of the OWL uh, visualization and their experience, and this is what probably explains why their concern with higher sea level goes down counterintuitively, is that while they thought this was a useful educational tool, they were not super impressed. And I'm not surprised by that because it wasn't super impressive. The particular location didn't show, you know, 101 inundated with water. If we had done that, I am fairly certain that the results would be different. But in this particular location, it was just not that overwhelmingly uh, significant what we showed. So we didn't show the dramatic impacts of sea level rise across the county. And a lot of people say, well, why don't you do this on the outer coast? We could show you a few things. <laughs> Appreciative of learning about the wetland restoration option, people hadn't envisioned that. People had no idea what that would look like, and that was really appreciated that, you know, there was a way of showing that there is a possible future. Not everything has to be a six-foot seawall. If you go to click again on concern and motivation, um, what's I think good and important for all of you to know is that county municipal staff, elected officials, and these conversation starters are deeply concerned about sea level rise. They are so, you know, seeing the reality of what's coming. Um, and many of them already talked about extensive personal experience they had um, of these emerging impacts, and both on the outer coast and the bayside. We didn't just have people from the bayside uh, communities. They're also highly motivated and supportive of doing something very comprehensively about it. And in fact, so often the recommendation was not to just focus on sea level rise, but while we're doing adaptation, why don't we also address our traffic problems, our affordable housing problems, and whatnot. Um, the last piece I want to say is an interesting finding for me is that um, when we ask or, or try to get at this sense of the empowerment and responsibility to affect change, it's pretty limited. Um, Despite all this motivation, lots of people just talked about all these barriers, government barriers, funding barriers, institutional barriers, you name it, of why they can't take action as easily as they would like to. Um, lots of, you know, recommendations of overcoming cross-silo, cross-jurisdictional, cross-level of government uh, barriers and, and, and working toward greater co collaboration. Um, what's interesting and maybe the most compelling sort of, you know, upshot from this uh, set of studies is that people constantly called for somebody else somewhere to take action. It was never them personally. It was most often, well, 
someone ought to do something, whether it was locally, and uh, I think David Pine is on this. You were mentioned, I don't know how many times, <laughs> that everybody is looking to you to, to take action, but it wasn't just that. It was somebody at the state level, somebody at the federal level. Um, it's always somebody else who needs to take action. If you go to the next slide, what does it mean for engagement? Well, so the task now is not anymore to persuade people there is a problem with, with sea level rise. Particularly among young, younger adults, people are getting that, right? It's not everybody who gets it, but by and large, the majority of people get that there is a problem. It's much more now about mobilizing people to action. Is there anything that can be done? What can I personally do to help contribute to that? Can I actually do that? Like, how do I do that? And can I do that? And will it make a difference? Those are the questions that need to be answered now. So it's, you know, I, I, I absolutely, and, and people in the focus group very much appreciate the careful and detailed assessment that the county is undertaking to identify where the hotspots, where the priorities, but it really, in terms of engagement, it's like, okay, how can I help? Make that really clear. And then the last piece here, and that's really the most important, is it's important now to engage face-to-face. -face. This is not about another messaging campaign. It's about bringing people in, working with them one-on-one -on -one or in small groups to get them mobilized for, for action. It's about creating solidarity among people, fostering hope, and building a sense of possibility, efficacy, and responsibility. And it's particularly a self-responsibility for it, not just pointing to somebody else to do it. That is what, you know, what we're learning so far. And this is preliminary, but I'm pretty sure that that's going to hold um, even with the additional findings. If you go to the next slide, then what does that mean? So in terms of the tips and tools for engaging people on sea level rise. And I want to give you just a few slides. We're going to go in, in, on Saturday in the training into much greater detail of how to do these things. But here is a recipe, and it, it, it begins, if you will, with know who you're talking to. And, and I don't mean, oh, it's elected official. I mean, what are their values? What are their interests? What are their motivations? What are their concerns, even feelings about this issue? And what are their constraints and barriers to take an action on it? You've got to understand that if you want to figure out, what am I going to try to get them to do? So there is a constantly going back and forth between identifying your audience and refining and refining and refining what the goal is that you want to achieve. And once you know how they think about it, what, what matters to them, what their values are, then you can frame the issue for them. Maybe it's about their children. Well, then you can frame it around that. Maybe it is about economic uh, opportunities in the Bay Area and ma maintaining Silicon Valley what it is. Whatever the frame is, there are many different ways of putting it, but depending on who you talk to, that's what needs to resonate. Those, those three things, the, the audience, the goals, and the frame, they have to go together, if you will. They have to be consistent. Now, once you know what you want to talk about, what you want people to do, who is the right person to say it? You know, if you're talking to a business person and you're a priest or you're an elected official, that may or may not be the right messenger for that particular message. Another economic, uh, you know, another business owner, another chamber of commerce person who is, you know, like on the same level, someone they trust, that might actually work, right? So again, who has the entry? Who has a good relationship? Who, are, who is trusted to convey that message? So it, all of this needs to be made consistent. And then it's a matter of empowering and enabling the audience to act, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, you need to not do this once. You follow up, you check in whether it's working, whether you got through them, you keep at it. And once you've, you know, you're learning lessons from that as you go, right? So then you either repeat or you adjust and, and you expand to the next audience. So you're building the coalition of the people that need to be involved. This is an all hands on deck situation, but not everyone will need the same message. So if you go into the next, um, the next slide here, what I really want to point out is that think about what communication actually means. You know, our, our uh, uh, webinar is called Finding Common Ground. Communication is about making common, making something common. That's the, what the word actually means. So if you think about this not as a messaging approach, but as if you click one more time, that communities are groups of people communicating, 
that is what you're aiming for, creating dialogue space, creating opportunities for people not to shout at each other, but to actually construct a problem that is way bigger than any of their you know, smaller ego concerns. That's, that's what our challenge is at this, at this time. So let me go to the next slide here and talk briefly, and again, I'm not gonna do this in great detail, but to, to, to essentially say something about all the internal barriers we all face. None of us love what we're hearing. <laughs> None of us love the bad news that is coming with climate change. And so the first thing we all do is that we don't wanna think about it. Thank you very much. Let me keep that at arm's length. It's what we call psychological distance. That is your first line of defense, essentially, against bad news. But let's, you know, we're managing, and the county has managed to get through to people. They are aware of it. And the next way in which we might defend against that bad news is that we don't want to feel, once we understand what could happen here, we don't want to feel the potential loss. We don't want to be in that much grief. It is so overwhelming. So the defense against this doom and gloom is really huge. Um, but let's just assume for a minute you actually would allow yourself to feel what the scientific information means to you personally. The next thing you will do is that you're gonna, you know, some part of you will feel, well, then we ought to do something about it, right? But then your day job comes in, the kids are crying, you have another meeting to go to, you don't have the resources. There is a huge dissonance that happens between what you feel you ought to do and what you're able to do or what you know how to do. And that cognitive dissonance you, you don't want to feel guilty. We go to a long stretch of defending against feeling that. So it's best to just dismiss the whole problem, right? It becomes much easier to say, ah, oh, can't be that bad, or you justify why you can't do anything. But let's just for a moment, again, assume that you actually would be willing to take action. That puts you in a position where you might be alone wanting to act on this, whether you're a political leader who wants to, you know, put stick their necks out, or whether you're a business CEO who needs to do this, all of a sudden you might be standing alone without any support from your community. Whoa, that is difficult. That is something that people don't like to do. So again, denial comes in because the risk of losing your cohort, your belonging, the group that you belong to is really big. And if you are that courageous and actually do it anyway, <laughs> then in the end, you might have to do something you've never done before. You might have to act that is maybe counter to who you thought you were, what defined you, and that might call you to change who you are. That's not something we do every Tuesday or next year or five times a year or whatever. That is something we are deeply defended against, and the further in we go to the core of who we are here around the defenses, the nastier our responses get. So this is a very common thing that people do and, and you cannot overestimate um, how important that is. If you go to the next slide, um, let me say a word about what empowerment means. And I'll, I'll just whiff through these so we can get through quickly. If you just click four times, I think um, you see it all. The first thing about empowerment, it is something about choice. Having the freedom and the power to make a different choice from this war is one element of empowerment. Um, the second one is that it actually means change, and that is not something we do easily. It's an emancipatory change, and what I mean by that is that you know you become a different person doing something. If you're feel, you know having not been empowered to do something, and you empower yourself, or you are empowered, you get into a place where you are a new person having the powers to make very different change, uh, choices. Your consciousness changes. Your sense of self changes. And the last bit of, of empowerment is that you need to actually know how. You need to have the capacity. You need to be enabled to do that, to make a different outcome actually happen. And, and just to you know, put that in your hopper, we could probably spend a lot of time thinking about what is power anyway? Is it power over to make someone do it? Or is it power to, this, in, uh, this ability, the capability of doing something different? Is it power with? to do something together in solidarity with others, or is it power from within to change your own way of thinking, your attitudes, your confidence, your sense of self? It's very interesting to think about that and what the implications are for empowerment. If you go to the next slide, if you're trying to figure out in your communication with others what would empower 
you know, whoever I'm talking to, whether it's my constituency or my colleagues, my staff or whoever, is there an opportunity to make a choice, to do something? And if not, how can you create such an opportunity? The second question is, does a person or a group of people actually use that opportunity? Because, you know, people have the choice in this country still to elect uh, or to go vote, right? Are they using it? Hmm. Big question, right? And if it isn't, why, if they're not using that opportunity, why not? What are their inner and outer barriers that they face? How can you help them overcome those barriers? That is what needs to be addressed in an empowerment strategy. And does that choice that they have actually result in the desired outcome? And if it doesn't, is there anything that you can do to move this in the right direction? Can you modify the choices to lead to better outcomes? So it's pretty complicated, pretty intense. If you click one more time, your strategic response to it, those three questions is you gotta focus on the sources of disempowerment, you gotta build on people's existing strengths, aspirations and capacities and capabilities, and then build them up. And I'm gonna actually skip the hope piece. Um, we can come back to that on Saturday if people are interested. But here's the upshot. The county are, is, you know, residents are already super concerned about current and future flooding, and they wanna see action. They wanna become engaged in the process, at least among the younger adults. That's where we see the greatest potential. Um, there's a persistent and widespread sense of it's somebody else's job to do it. So to help them overcome the, the barriers, we need to help people mobile, help mobilize people through empathetic understanding of those inner and outer barriers they face, work out an empowerment strategy, and then help people find hope from within themselves. You cannot impose hope on anybody. But doing it together is a very important element in that. And so with that, I'll just turn it over and we have a few more minutes for questions. Great, thank you so much, Susie, for the excellent presentation. And we do welcome questions if you wanna send them to me in the chat or uh, just post them to everyone. Uh, we'll respond to those. And in a minute, uh, I'll also ask Meredith to open up the phone line in case some of you are not connected to the WebEx. And the best way to facilitate that is if you wanna raise your hand, there's a little raise hand function, then I can call on you. Um, as Susie mentioned, we learned a lot from this project, a lot of things that work effectively with using these approaches, other things that need to be modified and advanced moving forward. We'll be looking at how to do so in our project uh, that we're now working on with the city of San Francisco and really addressing some key issues around how to scale what's working in this approach while uh, making it possible from a cost and technical standpoint for more communities to take advantage of these types of approaches. And also as the field of virtual reality is rapidly evolving to look at how uh, we can create more immersive experiences using uh, some of those new technologies. So I am uh, gonna turn to a question. Um, uh, that is from Laura Brown, Susie, and it is, how can we engage people who don't believe in climate change? Is there a different conversation to have? That's a great question. You know, a lot of people don't want to get engaged on a climate change debate, um, I mean, either because they just don't, you know, believe in it or because they hate the debate part. <laughs> But a lot of people are interested in getting engaged in their communities because this is where they live and there is something that they can agree on um, that you know, would make the community more resilient, more sustainable. So again, this, this comes back to that simple um, recipe that I gave you about you know, the steps of an engagement. You start with the audience where they're at. You're not about you know, starting from here's what I believe and that's where we're starting. You're starting from wherever they are and you identify what, what rocks their boat, what, what's interesting to them, where could they find their way in. Maybe it's working in their church, maybe it's working with a neighborhood community or whatever, right? So there's many, many different opportunities um, to figure out how you can get them engaged on something that is relevant to building the resilience of the community. Not everyone has to show up at the one, you know, Sea Level Rise meeting. There are many other opportunities, um, whether it's, you know, becoming more uh, 
uh, self-reliant in terms of electricity, um, you know, working uh, to reduce, I don't know, say air pollution by using renewable energies or something of that sort. So you need to find out what is it that matters to them, and then you begin to, you know, make that link. Whether or not you actually name it as a, as a starting point is a whole other question. I often start out not naming um, climate change just so that I can get my foot in the door, and eventually we can get there. But it might not be the starting point. Great. Thanks, Susie. And another question now from Katarzyna Trospek. What kind of actions do you look for from individuals? Well, I think it's, you know, the sea level rise is, is something that is very difficult to address all by yourself, right? There's a lot of things that individuals can do just to prepare better for uh, individual storm events, like having, you know, emergency kits and that sort of thing. There's a lot of things you can do in your household to, you know, reduce your impact on the environment. I think, you know, that's helpful um, because it, it teaches your kids um, what, you know, what people can do. It sets a different standard for and, and expresses a values in a certain way. It sends messages to your neighbor if you drive a different car, if you're, you know, having solar on your roof, that sort of thing. But in terms of getting to the, you know, higher order influence on, on the policies that guide the county, that guide your city, that guide the, the state and the, and the federal level, I think there it's a matter of voting, showing up for these meetings, showing your support or concern with particular direction that, um, that policies are taking, um, you know, writing to your representatives if it's a, a matter of state or federal policy. So it's, it's really about thinking what can you do from where you sit and, and do not underestimate what you can do in, in your family and with your neighbors, with your friends, in your businesses if you own a business. So, it's really trying to map out what your contribution can be um, without, you know, forgetting that, that there is really higher intervention needed, namely policies that set what kind of energies we use um, to reduce our impact on the climate, um, to, to really figure out, you know, where does the funding go? Does it go to, um, you know, a particular type of adaptation that actually makes things worse for the neighbors, or are we thinking collectively together with our neighbors to come up with a solution that works for all of us? So these are super tough choices, but to be engaged in those local conversations and to help shape and express your views to your uh, representatives at the state and federal level is absolutely essential at this point. Okay, great. We have another question from Renee Ananda. Um, we uh, asking about whether we considered socioeconomic status in the survey groups. The survey, there was just the five questions Susie mentioned, so that wasn't taken into consideration. But Susie, I'm wondering if you can answer the second part of her question. Um, what about considering where individuals live, i.e. those closest to her that live along the coast versus those located more inland, and I'm wondering if you have knowledge from other survey work that could help inform that question. Yeah, really interesting question too. So, you know, we have a little bit of insight from uh, on that from the focus group uh, participants. There, are about, uh, I think we had each focus group was somewhere between eight and twelve people, or something like that. So, times six. So, we have quite a number of people. Um, who um, gave us information about that, and many of them lived either directly on the on the bay shoreline, some of them directly on the ocean, and many of them in the middle, right, further outside of a floodplain. Um, and and what we've learned from that, what we've learned in Marin, where we did the first project of this sort, is that a lot of people get it that you know, while their house may be up on the hill, they got to actually go to work on those. On, on 101 or on one, um, they're they're very much seeing the impact in all of those places, and they're no less concerned about finding solutions that are comprehensive, um, whether they live further inland because their place of work might be there, or their shops, or their hospital, or their police station, or whatever might be in a, in an area that is actually exposed to the risk of sea level rise and flooding. So there is definitely that. If you're thinking about, you know, much further inland, say Montana, <laughs> that's a different question, right? So 
um, there, there are um, many, many different views and experiences that people have there in those locations. Generally speaking, the country is, is you can, so if you took a, a map of the U.S., you could actually see that the concern and the experiences with climate change and the desire to do something is very coastal. And there are a few, um, if you will, liberal hotspots uh, across the country in the middle, but the coasts in general are far more in favor of doing something about climate change and addressing these issues now um, as opposed to, you know, wait and see stance or, or debating the issue in the first place. So there's quite a bit of difference, but within San Mateo County, people who live up on the hill are just as much into it. Great, thank you. And thank you all for uh, joining us today. We really appreciated your interest and hope you found this useful. Um, I'm just going to now turn it over to uh, Hillary for any uh, closing remarks. Um, I did get some notes about uh, additional webinars covering the same kind of information. If you're interested in that, feel free to contact me at careactclimateaccess.org. Uh, but Hillary, any final comments? Great. Thank you, Kara. I wanted to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar today. And okay, great. Thanks, all.